is uh, it was determined by a coin flip uh, that was uh, well documented for fairness and being above board. This is a rough crew here. We have to be very, very worried about the integrity of this this group. Uh, First Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins. Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins is the Democrat, Democratic candidate for governor of Oklahoma and has always been a trailblazer. She was the very first Democratic woman to be elected Lieutenant Governor, the first woman to become Democratic leader of the House of Representatives. I didn't know that. It's pretty good. The first woman to be state representative from Southwest Oklahoma and the first woman to chair the Oklahoma Pardon Parole Board. To Jerry, her campaign for governor it's not about adding another first to her list of accomplishments. It is about bringing all Oklahomans together to build for the future. It's a great statement. Without further ado, Lieutenant Governor Jerry Astis. Thank you, Mayor. And it's a real pleasure to be able to be here with you all. I was thinking as we came over today, and I guess I should ask Mary, uh, you got any timekeepers, or are we kind of on the honor system? Okay, I'll take my watch off because I get excited. I know, really. I get excited about what we're talking about today, and I want to be sure um, to not overstep my bounds. It was just about four years ago. It was probably later in September, uh, but just about four years ago when, uh, as a candidate for lieutenant governor, I had an opportunity to attend a forum in Tulsa to answer questions about the aerospace industry in the state of Oklahoma. And up until that point in time, and both Lieutenant Governor candidates were there, that, that was who was there at that point in time. So um, I'm not a rookie. Um, I guess this is my return appearance. And I felt really good that day about the opportunity to talk about issues that I felt I had been familiar with while I had been serving as state representative. And I can remember thinking at that time just how far, uh, today is uh, thinking back to that time, just how far we'd come. Because it was in my last term as state representative that I filed some legislation talking about STEM initiatives and the way to try to encourage those who graduated with certain degrees in our state to stay in the state of Oklahoma. I couldn't get a hearing on the bill. It's probably because they didn't even really understand what STEM education meant. And look how far we've come that in just about two years after that, we were able to pass the Engineering Workforce Bill, which has had such a significant impact on the state of Oklahoma, and not just in terms of jobs, but in terms of what kind of message it sent across this country about what Oklahomans were willing to do to help build the platform of work that you all had started here. As Lieutenant Governor, I told you then that I intended to be a voice for the aerospace industry. And I can remember one of the questions that was asked uh, uh, my opponent at the time, asked both of us at the time, was if we were elected, what would we consider about the aerospace summit? Would we want it to continue? And what would we want to do? And I remember saying, and I think we both agreed, that our goal would be to no longer call it the Lieutenant Governor's Aerospace Summit, which uh, Congresswoman Fallon had been involved in as she was Lieutenant Governor and helping get that started. But because of other elected officials, we needed to take the title off of it. And I said we should call it the Oklahoma Aerospace Summit so that its life went beyond any particular elected official. And we did that, and I was grateful that we were able to do that. I've also been glad that we started the rotating to where that uh, summit now is held in Tulsa, as well as in Oklahoma City so that we have a chance to really promote that summit among the, in the hub, really, of aerospace manufacturing in the state of Oklahoma, which is this Tulsa area in Northeast Oklahoma. Every chance I had as Lieutenant Governor, I talked about aerospace. I talked about it to chambers of commerce around the state. I talked about it to civic clubs. I talked about it to legislators who would listen because I really and truly believe that it needed to be the next strategic priority for the state of Oklahoma. And everything we could do to make legislators and policymakers more aware of what you were already doing gave us a better chance to move ahead and begin to take the next step on what we could do next. We have many positives. We have had 
uh, more state representatives and state senators paying attention to what you all are doing than we've had in a long time. Uh, that's how we got the engineering bill passed. Clearly, we need more paying attention so we can get the moratorium lifted as quickly as possible. You all can help make that happen. But it did help raise the awareness of what Oklahoma was doing and what we can do next. I can tell you that I'm excited about what we have been able to accomplish. When I got elected, one of the first things I did was visit with um, the Governor's Council on Workforce Development. The very second report that they put out dealt with the aerospace industry in the state of Oklahoma and what the needs were for this important industry, uh, the statistics Rick just gave to you, and you, you all know them far better than I. It talked about the fact that with the baby boomers getting ready to retire, it talked about the shortage, specifically the shortage, of engineers that existed in Oklahoma's workforce, and it was not just a, um, a vacancy that was going to occur in Oklahoma, it was going to occur around the country as well. And what were we as a state going to do to put ourselves in a position to be able to fill that workforce so that work that you had ready on your platform didn't get moved to another state because you couldn't prove that we had the people in place to complete that work. After learning about that report and spending some time trying to digest it, I was able to have a meeting here in Tulsa uh, with about a dozen representatives of companies in your industry. And what I heard you say was that even though I wanted to talk about mentors in our schools and wanted to talk about more internships and what we could do, my takeaway from that meeting was you couldn't wait. You couldn't wait until the school kids got old enough to be able to begin in that pipeline. You needed workers now. And I can tell you it was your emphasis on the expediency of which we needed to act that led members of your industry as well as legislators to pass that Engineering Workforce Act. Being able to talk to you about what you need and then being able to respond and react and accomplish something is what I hope to be able to do as your next governor. And I think our conversations as we began have helped start. As Lieutenant Governor, I had an opportunity to become involved in an association that's usually pretty much lieutenant governors, the Aerospace States Association. And some of you have heard me talk about my involvement. I wanted to be part of the Workforce Development Committee because of what I knew Oklahoma needed. So I had a chance to serve as co-chair of that committee, and later um, became chair. And as a result of that committee, I had a chance to represent Oklahoma on more than one occasion before ASA, and in fact, in Washington, D.C., before the U.S. Department of Labor and the U.S. Department of Education when they had a joint task force meeting. To be able to serve on a panel with the governors of Vermont and the governor of Alaska, the lieutenant governors, he's now the governor of Alaska, uh, to be able to serve on a panel with them and be able to talk about what Oklahoma's aerospace industry was doing and what we saw the needs were in terms of developing that future workforce gave me a chance to brag about you. It gave me a chance to elevate Oklahoma's image as being more than a football state or a dust bowl state or whatever else, oil and gas state. It gave us a chance to talk about aerospace. We walked away from that conference and that panel and had an opportunity then to be more aggressively involved in what ASA was doing. Under the leadership of Lieutenant Governor Brian Doobie, who's currently the president of ASA, we created websites and we encouraged each state to do what they could to help promote aerospace. And I'm proud to say that our website became kind of the model for the other states. As Lieutenant Governor, we put a link on our website to aerospace. We connected with the Department of Commerce and jobs that were available that you all would let them know about. We connected with the uh, Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission. We connected with every resource we could find. We linked those to our website so that those looking for jobs or looking for workers or looking for resources would have a central place where they could go and find them. Because I believe aerospace should be the next strategic priority for the state of Oklahoma. Education and Training Day, I am so delighted to see that we have finished now uh, three years of a new part of the Aerospace Summit. An opportunity to do more than just have mentors and internships to try to light a fire among our young people, to get them as excited about what this industry can do as we did when we saw Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. We figured out 
that the best way to impact the greatest number of students was not to bring students in one at a time as a mentor or as an intern, but was an opportunity to impact classroom teachers. Because if you can change the opinion of a classroom teacher, you have the opportunity to touch every child he or she teaches. Education and Training Day for three years now has brought in 100 teachers who have been selected and called Aerospace Fellows. Teachers who have a chance to hear from you, members of the industry, who have a chance when they were in Tulsa two years ago, they had a chance to, or a year ago, to visit at American Airlines and see big planes and walk through and figure out what was going on. Teachers who, when they left, could leave with curriculum that was appropriate to the grade level they taught. And teachers who now continue to want to come back and be part of that program because they recognize it changes their perspective in the classroom. And they have an opportunity to get their students excited about science and math in a way that doesn't scare them. But instead of talking about when two trains leave the stations at different ends of the country and go different speeds, now they can talk about aerospace problems. And they can figure out a way to try to light a fire into the minds of these young people. I get excited about that and I'm pleased that this year for the first time we actually help present awards and help sponsor awards to teachers. We ask them to submit applications and for creative and innovative ideas of ways they could use the money. We sponsor awards to reward those teachers who were doing more. And we will continue to sponsor those awards next year. We've already made the commitment and signed the contract to make that happen. I'm excited that Oklahoma was one of the first 10 states. We were actually the second state asked to participate in a new program called the Real World Design Challenge. A program that puts students in a, a problem-solving competition, kind of like the Don Reynolds Cup. We really hope that over time it will grow. The first year, 10 states. This last year, 25 plus the, uh, the District of Columbia. We have 26 industry partners who help us with that program. Many of you are represented today. To be able to build that workforce you need for the future, we have to get our young people and our young adults excited about what you can offer them. To do that, we have to focus on education. We have a lot more that we can do in this state. I want to be part of helping do it. We need to applaud our colleges and universities like Oklahoma State University, who has a long tradition with their bachelor's, master's, and uh, doctorate programs. We have community colleges who are working on, on logistics degrees. We have a new degree about to be offered, a graduate degree by Oklahoma State University in our unmanned aerial systems. How exciting is it to know that Oklahoma has the only uh, airspace, the best airspace, over near Fort Sill in my part of the woods, um, to be able to test these UAVs. Oklahoma can do a lot more than we're doing right now. Aerospace needs to be our next strategic priority. We need to continue our collaboration with higher ed and career tech to make sure that we are filling the skills that you need. MRO University, other kinds of private skill trainings are absolutely the right kind of partners we have to have to be able to meet your immediate needs. Oklahoma has been a leader. Oklahoma will be a leader. Oklahoma needs a leader who is invested in your industry. I hope to be that as your next governor. Thank you very much. Ellen, a lifelong conservative with over 19 years in public office. First elected as a state representative in 1990, Mary was named Legislator of the Year for her work in the Oklahoma House of Representatives. She went on be to become the first woman and the first Republican Lieutenant Governor in 1995, a position which she held for 12 years. In 2006, Congresswoman Fallon was elected to the United States Congress, and if I remember correctly, representing the 5th District. Well, that's a good guess where she championed conservative causes and fought against the dangerous expansion of federal government, higher taxes, and government waste. Her position in the House Transportation Committee has been a very, very good benefit to the state of Oklahoma and certainly to the city of Tulsa. If I could introduce to you, please, Congresswoman Mary Fowler.
Well, thank you, Mayor, for that very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you today in this wonderful museum. I remember being here not too long ago for the aviation ball and talking about trying to get a space shuttle here, which I sent a letter on, by the way. But it's great to be here in Tulsa once again to talk about an issue that I know the Lieutenant Governor and I both share a passion for and something that's very important to our economy, very important to our state, and certainly one of our top industries, our third top industry in the state of Oklahoma, one that generates so much revenue, creates jobs and wonderful opportunities. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to the Oklahoma Aerospace Alliance. And I want to thank all of you who are members of the Alliance for taking the time to be a part of this group because you're part of not only the, the presence of, of Oklahoma and, and the aviation industry, but you're part of the future. And planning for the future is something that's very important to our state. Well, I want to tell you just real briefly before I tell you why I want to be governor of the state of Oklahoma and what I plan on doing about my interest in aviation. It didn't just start recently. I actually, back uh, in the late 70s and, and early 80s, was a member of the Oklahoma Pilots Association. I actually had an airplane in, in my family that uh, I used to love flying in. Did, didn't get my license, but I got within three hours of getting my pilot's license back a long time ago. And so I've been around airplanes for a very long time. When I became Lieutenant Governor back um, 16 years ago now, Jerry, I think it was, uh, one of the things that I wanted to focus on was growing jobs and good paying jobs in our state. And I knew that the aerospace defense industry was one of our top industries in our state. And you heard some numbers and statistics about how the aerospace jobs, an average job in Oklahoma pays about 29000 but an aerospace job pays about 55000 a year. And we have over 350 aerospace-related companies in the state of Oklahoma, $12 billion of industrial output to our state, of almost 150,000 related jobs in the state of Oklahoma related to aerospace. So I knew it was important to our economy. I knew it was important to our future as a state. So I asked Lieutenant Governor, I decided to bring together some folks in the industry and related to the industry to come serve on a Lieutenant Governor's task force in my office. And I invited those out in the private sector to come meet with me, those in career tech and higher education, those in, in government, Big Bird with the Aeronautics Commission, to come visit with me and to talk about the future of aviation and how we could further grow and expand jobs and meet the needs of the workforce for an industry that is very important to our state, plus to also work with our military installations that are very important in our defense industry and how we can continue to better position Oklahoma for more opportunities, not just that day, but looking way ahead in the future of our state. And out of that, uh, I remember Governor Henry called me up and said, uh, you know, I want to he wanted to be a part of that and have a governor's task force. And so I said, okay, well, let's work together. So he actually made me the chair of a, of a task force that he wanted us to work on as a state. And so out of that, we started bringing together alliances. And then we started the Oklahoma Aerospace, Lieutenant Governor's Aerospace Summit and Expo and brought in suppliers all across the state of Oklahoma, suppliers from across the United States, brought in key speakers to talk not only about where we are in aviation today, but where we can go in the future, to talk about the needs of that, and basically to do what we used to do in sales and marketing, a SWOT analysis, looking at our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and the threats to the industry in our state. And we even had uh, you know, different charts that we would put up, and we would talk about what are our strengths in Obama, how can we multiply upon those, what are our opportunities in our state, looking down the road, what are the threats to the state, which we knew was the education, the workforce, the engineers, you know, having the workforce that our, our industries would need, our military installations would need. And to look at all those different things, and of course you know the history of it now, I can't remember exactly how many years we've had, seven, seven or eight years now that we've had that. So it's been a, a great addition, and now that of course has grown the Alliance and, and so many other organizations. And then uh, later in my term as Lieutenant Governor, I actually became the National Chair of the Aerospace States Association and served as the National President for two years in Washington. It's kind of funny, I'd go to Washington and I would hold hearings with members of Congress 
on uh, the future of aviation, next generation air transportation systems, and, and the aviation industry, and workforce development, and all those things. And of course, it kind of, it's interesting how I later became a member of Congress, and then a member of the Aviation Committee in Congress, and having the opportunity to serve on the Transportation Committee, and even on the Armed Services Committee, which of course deals with defense contracting and our military insulation. So, I just tell you that because it's been a lot of fun to work in this industry and it's something I've had a strong interest in for a long time. So as governor, you will have someone who is very committed to this industry. I think I know it relatively well and plan to continue to do all that I can to well position Oklahoma and well position jobs in the aerospace industry in our state because it's a great industry. You know, we, we talk about our recession, we talk about the need to bring about economic recovery in our nation, in our state, and I promise you that the aerospace industry, the defense industry, our military installations, is one of the best things that we have going for our state. A great opportunity moving forward is Oklahoma. So I want to tell you why I'm running for governor and what I hope to do for the state. And frankly, the number one issue that I hope to work on as governor is jobs and creating a better business climate for our state so that we can grow more opportunities in aerospace, energy, agriculture, whatever the industry might be, but focusing on jobs and putting Oklahomans back to work. I was reading an article the other day about aerospace and about some jobs that were located in Oklahoma, Boeing actually, and they were talking about the quality of life, they were talking about the low cost of, of doing business, and we were talking about American expanding here and the low cost of, of doing business and just uh, the lower cost of doing business in the state of Oklahoma. And my focus on creating jobs, I'm gonna do everything I can to create the best business climate. And what that means is that we keep our taxes low and hopefully we can reduce our taxes in our state. It means that we focus on keeping our workers' compensation costs, insurance costs low, you know, that's, that's uh, one of the top uh, costs of doing business is workers' compensation premiums. It means that we have a fair legal system in the state of Oklahoma that uh, companies don't have to worry about the frivolous lawsuits in our state. And then, and then when we do those right things, we'll be able to grow jobs, create that investment, create that better business environment so that people want to come here and invest and grow their companies. Those are the type of reforms that I believe the aerospace industry will want to see in our state. And as governor, I promise you, I'll lead the charge to bring forth those type of, uh, of reforms. We know that higher taxes can hurt our, hurt our business attraction, can punish productivity and punish investment in our state. We know that high legal fees, higher costs, can all uh, keep investment away from our state and from growing. And the second thing in my plan is to focus on education and our workforce. We know that the aerospace industry has to have a highly educated, skilled workforce. And whether it's using our career tech system, and we have some great models, uh, Gordon Cooper, for an example, down in Shawnee, provides a lot of the workforce, particular Air Force Base and for Boeing, with the skill sets that they, they can bring. OSU that was mentioned with the unmanned aerial systems and the great opportunities they have there and the new degree that they have out there. Building a highly skilled workforce and focusing on education and strengthening that. That is one of the best ways that we can continue to grow and attract jobs in our state. And that's going to be a central thing to my, uh, to my governorship is how can we improve education? Getting money into the classroom, getting the results that we need, having highly skilled, qualified teachers, measuring the results and what we expect in our, in our schools, making sure that our children have the ability to read at great appropriate level, to do math and science, and holding people accountable so that we can measure those results. Those are all skills that uh, we need as we continue to talk about the need of, of the aging workforce and the engineers that we're gonna need in our military installations and even in uh, in our aerospace industry. Now I'll do that, like I said, by getting money to the classroom and, and, and evaluating our teachers and making sure that we have teacher effectiveness. And then the third pillar of my plan is making government more accountable, more cost efficient, more effective in what they do because it is our money as taxpayers and businesses that pays for government itself. 
I think we have uh, some government waste. I think that we have uh, duplication of services and government. And uh, when we have government waste, when we have government that's inefficient, that causes us to have budget shortfalls in, in some areas. And thus, we can't fund engineering tax credits. And we have moratorium on engineering tax credits, which I know are very important to uh, your industry. So making government efficient and effective will be a top priority of mine. And then the last pillar I want to talk about with my campaign is Washington. Having a leader in our state that's a governor, that when Washington starts to intrude in business and does things that I believe is harmful to our economy, harmful to job creation, whether it's raising taxes, whether it's taking over our national health care system, when it's doing those types of things, having a governor that will stand up and say, that's bad for job creation. I can't tell you how many businesses I talk to right now that tell me they're sitting on the sideline with investment and not creating jobs and not spending money because they're worried about what's coming out of Washington next, where it's going to be a takeover of the health care system, a new spending bill, more debt, more government over-regulation of, of industries. You know, they're worried about that. Having a government governor that will stand up and be a leader and say, no, Speaker Pelosi, that's not going to be good or getting our economy back on track. Well, I think my record speaks for itself, what I hope to do for the state of Oklahoma. I am very, very excited about our opportunities going forward with the aerospace industry, with business in our state, and with the right kind of leadership, being in the state that we're in with a low cost of living, low cost of housing, quality universities, quality career tech training. I believe that we can continue to build upon the momentum that we have in the aerospace industry and have a tremendous future ahead of us. So I just humbly ask for your support and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I've actually had the opportunity, as, as I mentioned, to serve on the Aviation Committee in Congress and visit some of the MROs, the maintenance and repair organizations, across other countries and to see our competition with those other countries. And as, as I said in, in my pillar of, of my plan for Oklahoma, is creating a better business environment so we keep our taxes low, so that we have fair workers' compensation costs, so we have a fair legal system. That will make us more competitive as a state, building up a stronger workforce, an educated workforce, partnering with higher ed, partnering with career tech, the MRO University, the OSU has a great plan with the unmanned aerial systems, partnering with our military installations, with Fort Sill. And we have some tremendous opportunities looking forward. And as, as was said earlier, you know, we have a, ter a tremendous amount of international exporting that we do, having a governor, Having a governor that will be on the front lines of working with the aerospace industry to open those doors and close those deals, frankly, with uh, the other countries is, is one of the things I hope to do. And frankly, even leveraging my uh, contacts nationally, working in Congress, and uh, working with the aerospace industry is something, industry is something I hope to do. I think we have a great opportunity to do more with some of the um, entities that already exist that have not probably been tapped to their fullest. Uh, Oklahoma is one of those states where, that a couple of years ago, I think probably was unlike any other state. We not only had in the Oklahoma Department of Commerce, in the um, Tulsa Mayor's Office, in the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce, and in the Lieutenant Governor's Office two years ago, aerospace experts, professionals who were actively involved in all four of those entities in helping recruit aerospace jobs to the state of Oklahoma. But what's significant about this question is it's talking about international contracts. The governor's international team is a group of professionals who are really working to try to bring business to the, to the state of Oklahoma. They are underutilized. They have ideas themselves of how they need to be reshaped and reformed to be more aggressive as being a partner with all economic development efforts in our state. 
and I believe having an opportunity to deal with those individuals who are used to working on the international level helps me as governor be able to do whatever they think is appropriate at the right time. We know that dealing with different countries, there's different protocols, and you have to be willing to jump and move at the right time. Uh, I've enjoyed that as Lieutenant Governor, as having an opportunity to make those business phone calls and to entertain those guests from other countries who are coming and looking at our state for doing business. We can do a better job. The Governor's Office needs to lead that effort. Thank you. Next question. Setting aside Fort Sill, McAllister, and Tinker, what would you say to the next BRAC Commission to help protect Vance Air Force Base and Altus Air Force Base from RAC action in the future? And I believe we go back to Congressman Ballard. Yeah. Nope. It's, we're pretty good at this. I think it's okay. <laughs> I mean, we've done this a lot, three it's, times it's, this week. It's, it's the Mary Jerry Show and Jerry, you're on. Oh, that's, that's fine. That's good. You know, one of the good things about, in, in, uh, lately, in, a, in about just about 10 days ago, I think, we had an opportunity to participate in a forum that was down in Southwest Oklahoma with an entity called the Community Partnership Council, which even though it was 50 mile radius from Fort Sill, it picked up Altus Air Force Base. And we had a chance in, in, in the cities, the towns, the counties, all of the governmental entities uh, in that area who have been working since the last BRAC and are already working in preparation for the next BRAC. So working in Altus um, and, and the Vance Air Force Base, we know that those are um, always going to be looked at by different groups. As governor, we have to be prepared to say that the state is doing whatever is necessary, whether it's creating additional buffer zones that are uh, appropriate for um, the takeoff and landing, so the training that needs to go on. I'm concerned, and I know that there is concern, up in the Enid area that there is a potential new wildlife management area that may get developed that looks pretty exciting if you're talking about it from a wildlife standpoint, but the Air Force isn't that excited about it, and it doesn't really matter how much fun we might all have hunting ducks, it could be a real problem in the next back BRAC round if we do not have that kind of communication to make sure that local communities and state agencies understand that decisions that are made have a long-term impact on these kinds of entities. So the state of Oklahoma has to be forward thinking. We don't need to wait till the next BRAC is announced that it is beginning for us to continue to work uh, to make, our, make sure that we are prepared to save all five of our military installations. Um, but we as a state and, and me as governor, uh, we have an opportunity to help lead that discussion and start now by making sure that our communities are making all the right steps to put themselves in the best position. I think the governor has to play a leadership role in working with all of our military installations across the state. And I'm very proud that Oklahoma has been very proactive in doing the things, taking the steps that they need to take to make sure that we're brack proof. And that is one of the reasons why I think we saw Fort Sill get so many new jobs is because they have been working ahead, not waiting until the BRAC Commission met, but looking years ahead and preparing and planning for that. You know, I will say one of the things I hear over and over as I meet with generals and, and uh, people at the Pentagon and, and Washington, and I do that quite a bit, is they really appreciate the great community support that we have around our military installations. I can't tell you about the large groups of people that will come from Vance Air Force Base, from Enid, from uh, Altus, from Lawton, even from Oklahoma City, that will come to Congress and we'll have all kinds of breakfasts and, and it'll be maybe be 40, 50, 60 people from those various military communities who will come up and we'll invite various members from the Pentagon to meet with them and just to show that strong community support to have the elected officials there, to have the members of Congress there, the U.S. Senators there, to say, we as the Oklahoma families appreciate our military installations, we're behind them, we're going to do whatever we need to do to help you be successful. That community support and leadership at the top is very, very important when it comes to the decisions that they make for BRAC. We've done some great things around our military installations in, in many different areas, acquisition of land, and right of way, making sure that uh, we have sufficient housing, infrastructure, water, sewage, you know, those things are very important. Working very closely with our congressional delegation, and, and frankly, being a member of Congress, I've got a great relationship with all of our congressional delegations. I've been on the Armed Services Committee. I know all the people pretty well. I've been around uh, 
of course, the members of the leadership at the Pentagon. Public-private partnerships are very important. I know uh, at uh, Enid, they, they had a great public-private partnership on housing, where the private sector and public sector came together to, to create better housing upon that uh, Air Force base. So those type of steps that are taken strengthens our position as a state so that when the next round of discussions come, hopefully Oklahoma will be well positioned to where we actually add jobs, like we have sometimes in the past, versus losing jobs. And a governor being involved will be very important. Thank you. This is a general aviation question. How would you address the threat to general aviation posed by proposed EPA changes to fuel specifications? Is it my turn again? Well, I think EPA is making all kinds of threats to so many different industries in the state of Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, as a governor, speaking up, you know, so many times uh, you'll find uh, different states sitting on the sideline. But, you know, I've been very vocal when, the, when I believe the federal government's getting out of the out of, uh, realm of what they should be, could cost of jobs and opportunities. You know, speaking up and certainly uh, any type of threat to uh, fuel sources and changes in that and, and the aviation industry in general would be a big concern. And so I'm sending letters, speaking up, talking to our congressional delegation, those are all important things. And, and I know uh, over my past couple of years on the aviation committee and certainly the challenges that we had when the price of jet fuel went up really high a couple of years ago and financially hurt many of our commercial carriers and certainly you know, we have some American Airlines folks here. You know, we saw a, a huge drop in profitability, of especially our commercial airlines, and certainly hurt our, our private companies too. So having someone that will speak up when we see things that would cost us jobs and, and be harmful. I think it is important that on all of these issues um, that deal with federal regulatory agencies that the governor's office have a working relationship with the congressional delegation. And I have begun to ask those members of the delegation if they would be willing to engage in regular meetings. Uh, I, think, I think Governor Keating did that. I'm not positive. Um, and I think it needs to happen. Oklahoma's not a large enough state with a large enough delegation to be able to carry a lot of clout unless we all stand together on issues. And that means whether it's the um, Speaker of the, House, of the Oklahoma House of Representatives, the pro tem of the Oklahoma State Senate, and the governor as the leaders in Oklahoma communicating with our five congressional men because they are all going to be men this next time, and, and our U.S. senators. It gives us an opportunity to say that regardless of our political party, we stand first and foremost for Oklahoma. We stand first and foremost for protecting the businesses in our state. And having the opportunity to say, you know, before you jump ahead and, and, and have these changes on fuel specification, has the e EPA considered all of the consequences that are going to occur, occur to business and industry when those are implemented? And it is, our, it is our, our responsibility to make sure that we speak with one voice about exactly what will happen. And it's not that hard to quantify the dollars and cents that are going to be impacted if some of these changes occur. We have to speak together. Thank you. This next question is, is something that um, I have certainly become very close to over the past couple of years. It's our Opportunity Fund question. Um, many of you in the room may be aware that we have a new hangar out of Tulsa International that we, we opened about, Rachel, 18 months ago. Um, that took many years and, and both of you were involved in, in getting that hangar built and, and it was built with money that came from the state through what was called the Opportunity Fund. Um, our chambers, our economic development people in the state work very hard to attract new companies, but we've now started to, to shift that focus to retaining the companies that are already here. What would you do as governor to help put something in place like an opportunity fund that would um, be an incentive to retain companies that are here in the state now? I, I think that ought to be. I think we have to have it, and the difficulty has been the Opportunity Fund never got fully funded as it was intended, and unfortunately part of that happened when we really did have money, and we could have put uh, additional state dollars into it, and it just didn't happen. I believe we have to have uh, a fund for keeping business. That ought to be our first priority. It doesn't matter whether you're 
um, on, a, on a main street in Duncan, Oklahoma, or, or near the Tulsa airport and some of the facilities that you all have, being able to keep the jobs of the people that you currently have is the best way for economic recovery. Being able to keep those people employed is a whole lot better than having to let anybody go because it's those salaries that turn over and over and over again in our communities and keep those dollars growing. And, and that is how we will get ourselves out of this economic recession that we are in. We have to keep the jobs we have. But when we create that fund, and we need to make changes in the way we do the Opportunity Fund, it needs to be set up in a way that it is not, it needs to have a filter. It needs to have a filter that are not government elected officials. It needs to have a filter of people who understand business, who understand venture capital, who understand enterprises, and have the ability to go through these applications and then make recommendations to a panel um, in a quick process. I don't mean a long three-month thing. This, these things have to turn quickly. But it needs to be set up in a way that it cannot get caught up in the political process or the political games that get played that if so-and-so is going to get this much money, then I want that much money. We have to be able to understand we are not that big a state. We all have to pull together. And what's good for Tulsa, Oklahoma, I believe is good for Duncan, Oklahoma. Well, I, I will tell you that I'll support trying to resolve the legal challenges to the Opportunity Fund that we have had. And I support having some type of what is intended to be a governor's closing fund. You know, one that which when we get opportunities and we have to act fast and we have someone that's looking at bringing a major investment into the state of Oklahoma and major jobs into the state of Oklahoma, that we can be competitive as a state. I had an opportunity not too long ago to meet with one of our top Fortune 500 business recruiters in our in companies within our nation and he was talking to me about all the things that states do to attract jobs and opportunities. And he said a lot of states, like Texas, Governor Perry, has a governor's closing fund. And when there comes a time to where there's one state competing against another state and someone's offering engineer tax credits or maybe something like a Quality Jobs Act or something that uh, is making one state more competitive to another, to give a governor a little bit of flexibility in trying to negotiate to get a major investment in jobs. And I too think you have to have an independent source of, of experts that will look at the cost versus the benefit of what a state does offer as far as being competitive uh, in those attraction of, of jobs itself. Should keep politics out of it, as was just said. But we all know that we operate in a very competitive state within our, our nation itself, and there are a lot of states that will offer training, will offer different tax credits. I don't think you offer anyone that comes to your state some type of incentive or credit, but strategically having a fund that is available to a governor with the advice of people out in the private sector that are experts involved in investment and opportunities is something I think we should consider as a state. We have time for one more question. This, one's, this one can be kind of fun. If this were a meeting at the OERB, the Oklahoma Energy R Resource Board, okay. those great commercials on TV, would you still be promoting aerospace growth as, as your top strategic, strategic uh, <laughs> priority? <laughs> yeah, Lieutenant Governor. Actually, it's oh. But I'll go first. It doesn't matter. Um, I, Absolutely, because I said the next strategic priority for the, the state of Oklahoma needs to be the aerospace industry. And I think that um, it, all, it all works together. Oklahoma, is, um, I would tell you that about 10 or 12 years ago, the first strategic priority, I believe, where really the state invested was biomedical research. I believe the second one, a few years ago, was an effort to begin to create the Bioenergy Center, which is a combination of research opportunities from our agricultural and our energy industries. So I don't have any problem, in that. And, and, and those oil and gas guys have been in those chamber meetings when I have said aerospace is where it is next, and we have to be able to do that, so there's no doubt. Well, I am for creating jobs and building a stronger economy in the state of Oklahoma. 
happen to believe that aerospace is one of our great opportunities moving forward as a state. And I also believe the energy sector is one of our great opportunities uh, for our state. The Lieutenant Governor and I both spoke Sunday night at the uh, Oklahoma Independent Oil and Gas Producers Association. We talked about energy in Oklahoma. I believe agriculture offers a lot of great opportunities for our state. Tourism, Tulsa's been working on their tourism product, offers a lot of great opportunities, but certainly uh, anything that creates investment in our state, anything that brings jobs to our state, creates jobs that will pay better in our state. I'm, I'm interested in higher paying jobs in our state and building those opportunities will be things that uh, I will, I'll be promoting. So I like all jobs. Thank you. Very